they often have problems fully closing their eyes. Um, they're often unable to whistle or to blow their cheeks out and might have difficulty sucking through a straw. Um, it's an asymmetrical presentation which a lot of the neuromuscular conditions present very symmetrically, um, but one of the characteristics of FS FSHD is that can, it can be asymmetrical in its presentation. Scapular winging is a huge issue for these patients and it can be really quite severe and when you see the scapula kind of literally popping off the back of the chest wall, it can be um, quite alarming when you see it for the first time. They can also pre um, present with foot drop and that can cause problems with gait mobility function. Mm -hmm. Abdominal weakness as well and that can cause quite a lot of issue in terms of back pain and changing how they mobilize and their compensations and their patterns of movement. Pain can be an issue for FSH so some of the pain they experience is musculoskeletal. There's quite a lot of feedback isn't there? Is it because I'm moving around? I, I, I'm not very good at scanning still. I like to. <laughs> um, is that better? So it's, it's not me moving around. So pain, they can get kind of secondary musculoskeletal pain, but I think I can't. I couldn't really find the words to describe it. They just have an FSHD type pain. Um, on top of their normal kind of secondary musculoskeletal pain. Can anybody else think of a better way to describe it? <laughs> they just, pain is a, is a presenting issue for these patients. Um, it can affect respiratory function, but I think we think it's more to do with the abdominal weakness as opposed to it being an actual um, part of the condition itself. It is progressive, and the rate at which it progresses varies. I think we tend to see if it presents earlier, perhaps the rate of progression is quicker than if it presents later. It's like that scratching your fingers on a... <laughs> um, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, it doesn't usually limit life expectancy, um, but it can also have some extra muscular it does cause them pain, it does affect their function and ability to participate in normal ADLs. And when we're dealing with this, we do explore the use of lycra, um, other various kind of shoulder supports. Stretches are really important as well, just to help maintain passive range of movement. And also surgical intervention is an option for some patients, but from what we see, there's quite a mixed bag of results, some patients really report huge benefits, some patients don't. It's big surgery um, and knowing when the right time to look at that as an option is always a tricky thing. Um, pelvic weakness and foot drop, again, that can affect mobility. So we do refer into orthotics looking at various types of ankle splints to help with their foot drop and the usual kind of mobility aids and um, looking at how we can support them from that point of view. Um, thinking about pain, using all our usual kind of physical management, orthotics can be used to help manage pain. Usual physical management can be used to help manage pain, but also sometimes they do need some medication as well. Um, currently, there are no standards of care available in terms of care recommendations for these patients. Duchenne. Um, so this is probably one that you're all more familiar with. It's an X-linked recessive condition. Um, so the females are the carriers, but only boys are affected. However, we do know that some of the female carriers can be manifesting carriers, so they can show some of the same um, signs and symptoms as the boys with Duchenne, but not kind of full-blown Duchenne, but they certainly can experience some of the um, problems that the boys see. It's caused by mutation in the dystrophin gene. So dystrophin is a protein that is really important in maintaining the structural integrity of muscle. Um, and what happens is there is an absence of dystrophin being expressed. So over time, the muscle becomes damaged. 
the contractile muscle becomes fibrose, and this leads to, to weakness and um, the problems that we see in these boys. So these boys, Duchenne, they have hugely elevated CK levels, and I'm talking tens of thousands, really, really high. Um, Becker muscular dystrophy is a less severe form, present, less severe presentation than Duchenne. It's caused by a mutation in the same gene, um, but there is still some expression of dystrophin. So it's, there's not a total absence of it as there is in Duchenne. So often these patients, these boys present later um, with slower progression, but the same signs and symptoms that we see in boys with Duchenne. So your clinical characteristics, it's often, it, it is progressive. We know it's progressive. Um, what we often see in the younger ones is the, those large calves. They might have problems or show a, a gowers a sign when they're getting off the floor. So you can see the picture in the corner there. So these boys, they turn onto their front, wide base, push up from the floor, and they might push up on their legs. And that's a, a typical gowers and a typical characteristic of Duchenne. Age of diagnosis, what's the, age, what's the average age of diagnosis now, Anna? Between four and six. So these problems present when they're young, but it can be a bit of a journey to getting these boys diagnosed. Contractures are a major component of this condition, and they become more problematic as the disease progresses and the boys get older. Loss of ambulation, so around about the age of 15, give or take a couple of years either side, is generally when we see boys lose ambulation, and they do have cardiac and respiratory involvement as well. And we also see the cumulative impact of the, the long-term use of steroids. So steroids have absolutely revolutionized how the boys do and the, the presentation and the quality of life that these boys have. It's absolutely slowed down the progression, but what we see is they have, they're short in stature, they're often quite large, the cushionoid face, and the problems with bone density because of the long-term steroid use and delay puberty. So there are all these other problems that we see that kind of are part of the long-term steroid use. Um, so their needs change as the disease progresses, really. An orthotic intervention is, becomes more important and probably, um, what's the word? Well, more important and when they start to develop ankle contractures. So as they get older, as the disease progresses, they can get very tight in their ankles and other joints as well. And managing these ankles is really, really important. And I'm going to be very careful that I don't go on about this too much because it is a huge passion of mine, but managing ankle contracture is really, really important in maintaining mobility and function for as long as possible. We know that ankle contractures can take boys off their feet, even when they're strong. Um, so we need to manage them well, and we need to manage them properly. Um, they get weaker, we know that, and we, at that point we're then looking at kind of wheelchair and mobility aids. They still have orthotic needs, but it might kind of change into more um, daytime AFOs, managing the contractures from that point of view. They do have respiratory and cardiac involvement, um, and with the um, introduction of NIV, their respiratory status remains better for much longer these days. Um, and there is a link at the bottom there, so there are standards of care, and they've been recently revised in 2018, so they're a really useful reference point just in terms of outlining what care is recommended for these boys. And I would definitely recommend that everybody just has a little look and is aware of them. So myotonic dystrophy um, is the most common form of adult muscular dystrophy, affecting around 1 in 8,000 of the population. Again, there are two types. There's myotonic dystrophy type 1 and type 2. Um, but Primarily in this country, we see mostly the M1. Um, and it's actually, it, what happens is it's a mutation in the DMPK gene, but it's an unstable 
expansion. And what we see is, as the disease is dominant, so there's a 50% chance of inheriting it from an affected parent, as the, the generations go on, the disease often becomes more severe, and that's because the mutation is an unstable mutation and can actually expand as the generations go on, giving rise to more severe symptoms. And we would see mild or moderately elevated CK, CK levels in these patients. So it's a, it's a multi-system disease. It doesn't just affect muscles. Um, it is slowly progressive. Cataracts can be a problem. Associated learning difficulties, kind of, I guess, frontal issues with the patient, frontal um, difficulties. Cardiac and respiratory involvement is common. Um, they have quite a lot of facial weakness, so they can get quite, they can get temporal weakness. They have a very nasal speech. Um, ptosis can be a problem. Daytime sleepiness can be a problem. So you can see that these poor patients, there's a list, endless list of um, signs and symptoms for this condition. Um, they do get muscle weakness and foot drop can be quite a significant problem for these patients and this is often why we see them in orthotics. So again, this is a busy slide because they have lots of issues and they can often be a very challenging group of patients to manage because of their variety of um, problems that they experience. Um, so we do often see them in orthotics, um, ankle splints, quite a lot of them need bespoke shoes. So I know Rosa and Meredith, they've got an interesting case study later on that they'll share with you. Um, and there is consensus based recommendations for care for these patients. But am I right just thinking that there, there is a working group looking at Um, but there is, again, a link for the current consensus-based recommendations. Um, moving on to limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So there are over 30 types. It's kind of an umbrella um, limb girdle muscular dystrophy. There are lots of different subtypes of that. There's a new classification that is now being used. Um, it's, usually, it's usually slowly progressive, but there are some types that are more rapidly progressive. Um, it can be recessive or dominant, depending on the, the type of limb girdle. And these patients, you would mostly see an elevated CK2. So this is the new classification system. I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's just to make you aware of it, really. Um, so basically, it used to be um, type 1 or type 2 with a, um, a letter. However, new ones have been discovered and they've run out of letters, so they've reclassified it. And type one, the dominant, has been replaced with D, and type two, recessive, has been replaced with R. And instead of the alphabet, they're using numbers because there's more numbers than there are letters, and there's new ones being discovered all the time. So you might see the old one referred to in letters or diagnoses, but this will be probably coming in more, potentially. So just to be aware of it. So clinical characteristics, because there's so many, I guess what they have in common is a limb girdle weakness. So we expect to see these patients with a weakness across the shoulder girdle and weakness across the pelvic girdle. However, they can also present with distal weakness and depending on which type of limb girdle they have subtle variations in the way that they present and the patterns of weakness that we see. Some of them have cardiac and or respiratory involvement. There's a huge variation in phenotypes, even within the same family. So the, fa the same family might have the same condition, but family members can present quite differently. Um, and the, the different types of limb girdle you might see certain characteristics. So, for example, the dysphalinopathy patients, one of the early signs that you often see is that they struggle to go up onto their tiptoes. So they report kind of going up the stairs or running as being one of the first things that they struggle with. And then the, the limb girdle two eyes, they have a very particular way that they get up from the chair. So they would kind of bend over to the floor and then come up into 
understanding. And that's a kind of quite a um, specific way for that particular condition. It's largely adult onset, but not exclusively. There are some that present in childhood. Um, and pain is not necessarily a presenting issue. So it's not part of the limb girdle um, condition. But we do see a lot of patients complain of pain, and we think that's kind of secondary musculoskeletal pain because of their compensations, because of their patterns of weakness. Um, so it is a group of conditions, and there's a spectrum, mild to severe, and everything in between. Um, again, we see a lot of these patients in orthotic clinic. They have huge orthotic needs. They have huge physical management needs. Um, and we have used splints, lycra, um, and various other concoctions that Meredith and Rosa will talk to you about today. Um, and so the respiratory and cardiac, again, they are um, managed with ventilation and some medication as well. And there are currently no standards of care available, but I know that there's lots of work going on, and Anna will probably touch on, I don't know whether you do in yours, no, yours is more drugs. So there, are, there is work going on to hopefully develop some standards of care for this group of patients. So SMA. Um, I will touch on this. How am I doing for time? Do I need to? Right, I'll speed up. OK, SMA. Um, it's caused by a mutation in the SMN gene. Um, SMN1 and SMN2 genes code for a protein that is really important in the function of the motor unit. Um, SMA is caused by a genetic mutation in the SMN1 gene, um, as this, and this gene produces most of the functional SMN protein. People have a differing number of SMN2 copies, and the SMN2 does produce some of this protein, but not a lot. But what we do know is, depending on the number of copies of the SMN2 gene, this can modify the disease. So for patients with more SMN2 copies, um, they tend to have a less severe disease than if they have a smaller number of SMN2 copies. It's a recessive condition, and it affects boys and girls. OK, so very briefly, these are the three main types that you probably will come across. So your type 1 SMA, um, these are the, unfortunately, babies that probably are likely to die before the age of two. They're your floppy babies, um, respiratory difficulties, um, will never sit. Your type 2, so these children will sit unaided but will not achieve standing, and they are still at risk of problems with um, respiratory function as well. And then your type 3, so... They will achieve independent walking, but they may lose ambulation as they get older. Um, so SMA is a genetic diagnosis, but it's a clinical classification. Um, we also have a type 0, but you probably won't see many of these because, unfortunately, they die very young. So these are the babies that are born with contractures at birth and um, severe respiratory problems from birth. Um, and also there is a type 4, which is uh, adult later onset. Um, the phenotype, the SMA phenotypes are changing with the introduction of new therapies. Um, so this does have an impact on the way that we manage them because we're entering unknown territory. Um, but orthotics is a huge um, part of the management for these children and adults. Um, and have you got an SMA case study later? Right, I won't. I'll move on. There are SMA standards of care. And again, they're really useful just to be aware of and to know where to look for them. So orthotic trends. So we did a service evaluation. Um, it was a 12-month period. We looked at who was being referred into our clinics and what orthotic intervention we were giving um, and this isn't proportionate, but it just gives you an idea of the trends that we were seeing. So for the most common conditions, these were the most common orthotics that um, were provided for these patients. And you can just see kind of the, the trends and the, um, what is given for each patient group there. 
And interestingly, speaking to Geeta last night, I know the CMT cohort make up a lot of your orthotic clinics. Um, however, in Newcastle, we don't actually see the CMT patients, so it's not that they're, they're not accounted for in terms of numbers, it's just that we don't see them in our clinic. However, we know that they have huge orthotic needs. Um, and I can't do a talk without touching on the importance of evaluation. Um, I think we all know it's important, and I think it's safe to say we all know we could probably do it better. So accurate assessment of the patient, I think we all do that brilliantly. So we assess objectively, we assess using various measures, we decide what they need, we put that in place, and then what do we do? I don't think we're great at evaluating the impact of our intervention, not just orthotics, but generally. And I think it's really, really important that we do that. Um, and unfortunately, with this cohort of patients, we know that sometimes the objective measures don't necessarily reflect the benefit that the orthotic has provided. So you could do your objective measures and it might not show you that much, but you ask the patient what they think of their orthotic and they think it's great. And the impact that it's had on their quality of life is huge, but we're not capturing that. And we know in the literature, the patient satisfaction isn't very well described. And I think there's definitely a place for us to use patient reported, reported outcome measures to, I suppose, more sensitively reflect the actual beneficial impact of the intervention of the orthotic given to that patient. And I think that's just something for us to be aware of. Um, the evidence base, obviously we should be providing care based on the best available evidence. We know that the evidence base for this group of patients isn't the best, but I do think we have a duty to try and contribute to that evidence base. And you know we can do that on a small scale by evaluating our own practice but also hopefully by bringing lots of people together today, it will make us want to contribute to the, um, the wider evidence base. And by doing that, by doing all of these things, we can improve the standard of care. And ultimately that's what we want to do. We want to provide the best standard of care that we can to these patients. And I guess, there we go. I guess my take home message today, because I, I know I need to speed up, what I want us all to think about, and which I know we do, regardless of the diagnosis, regardless whether they have a diagnosis, regardless of what, whether you know about the condition or not, what we're ultimately aiming to do with any of our intervention is to optimize function and manage their decline with dignity. Um, and I think we're in a very privileged position to work with these patients to be able to do that. And I think that's what Whatever else is going on, however much you know about the condition, keep that in mind and do the best by our patients. So I'm going to hand over to Geeta to talk a little bit about the CMT, and then if there's time, I don't know whether there's... We're, we're well over time, um, but I uh, appreciate it's an important okay, part, so... Super quick. If I can... Okay, I will be super quick. I've only got a couple of slides. So just to do what, similar to what Dion's done, uh, just done. So I'm Geeta Ramdari. I'm down at um, National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery um, in London. I'm a consultant HP there. And um, so ours is an adult service. We do um, have see uh, children transition from Great Ormond Street, but it's, it's sort of 17 upwards for, for us. So... Um, with peripheral neuropathy, again, just to give you a little bit of background, so these are diseases of the peripheral nerves, and some of them can be inherited. We know there's over 100 genes now that cause inherited polyneuropathies, um, and they can also be acquired. And we have a big group of... Oh, hang on, I've just lost the whole thing. When did that happen? Ah, no, it's back. Excellent. Um, we have a lot of people with, with um, inflammatory neuropathies as well, so CIDP, um, Guy and Barry, who, who don't fully recover. So that's quite a big one for us. Um, so, um, but you can also get, um, uh, because of um, infections as well, um, and we do see the odd uh, polio patients um, sort of in their 50s and 60s now. Um, so you can also split uh, neuropathies uh, up into which structures are, tend to be affected. So you have your demyelinating polyneuropathies, so you have a, a denuding of, of the axon. Um, and and in, a, in an acute situation like in Guillain-Barre, you've got your conduction down the, the this is a motor neuron, um, and you get a conduction block. 
um, because you can't carry on with the saltatory conduction beyond um, where, where the myelin is, 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 um, is damaged. Um, so examples of this are guillain barre syndrome in terms of the acute side. Um, but then you also have chronic um, CIDP, which comes on more insidiously, but it still comes under the same inflammatory umbrella. Um, and you, what's quite classic when they look neurophysiologically with them is, is this conduction block, which you don't see with other types of demyelinating neuropathy, such as Charcot-Marie tooth disease. So CMT1A is the most common type. It accounts for about 50% of cases, and that is a, a slowly, very slowly progressing, starts in the first decade of life. So they're, they're often the, um, the teenagers that we see coming from GOSH. Um, and there you get, it's a slightly different situation because it's a slower um, d um, demyelination. So you get compensation. So you, these um, voltage-gated ion channels will sort of try and compensate and go down the nerve. So you don't get conduction block, but you get slowing of the action potential. So that's quite diagnostic. So often they'll have seen that, be very suspicious, and then they'll do the genetic testing based on that. Um, we also have axonal um, polyneuropathies. So uh, this is where you actually have a, a dying back of the axon itself. And, and with time, um, the uh, Schwann cells will also die back the, who, that, that make the myelin, because the two need to, they rely on it. There's growth factors go between the axon and the Schwann cell. Um, and an example of this are the axonal types of, of inherited neuropathies. So the most common type is CMT type 2A due to the mitofusion. It's a, it's a mitochondrial gene that's affected there. And they're one of the most severe um, phenotypes that we see, um, and again, um, starts in childhood, and again, we see quite a few um, of, of uh, the kids with CMT2A transition to us as teenagers. Um, the most common type of axonal polyneuropathy is diabetic neuropathy, of, of course. Um, so um, you can, it, it's mainly thought, seen to be sensory um, in origin, well, in presentation, but we know there can be uh, motor problems as well. Um, and then you can have the toxic neuropathies, alcohol or drug induced. So we're seeing a lot of critical care and also chemotherapy neuropathies. Um, and then very rarely, but occasionally in London, we might see leprosy. Um, and so this is where you'll have um, a complete drop in the, act the action potential um, will just stop. Okay, so presenting problems very quickly. Um, we see some um, weakness and, and severe wasting here. And so this is somebody with CMT. And when you look on MRI, um, you have the fatty infiltration here. These are the, the calf muscles, um, which is, uh, whereas the distally, approximately, they're relatively spared a little bit. But you see this volume loss here. Well, we think that's probably some secondary um, wasting due to disuse. Um, and there's some evidence there's sort of fatigability as well. Um, but joint deformity in some types of CMT, particularly type 1A, are really common. So this is somebody who came, when we first saw him, he had both of his feet looked like that, and then he had surgery. Um, and so joint deformity, uh, lo loss of range in certain muscles around the, the ankles, um, and that affects the walking patterns, repeated injuries. And in axonal types of, um, of polyneuropathies, neuropathic pain is quite common, and, and it's more prevalent certainly in this group, and it can impact on quality of life. Um, but also, we mustn't forget, we've been looking and thinking a lot about the motor function, but there's also a big sensory issue with these guys. So this is just a bit of work we did in the lab. Um, we got people with CMT in and did um, some uh, posturography. And so this, this is the center of the velocity of the center of pressure when somebody stood around and they're swaying. And so we can see in the CMT group, they, the, the velocity is much, much higher because they're swaying around a lot more than the controls. Um, and actually then when they close their eyes, this is called the Romberg's quotient. Their, their sway gets a lot worse. So there's a visual dependence because of proprioceptive loss, and that can have a real impact on balance. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the case. Um, and in terms of what we use, foot orthoses are very commonly prescribed to try and um, decrease pain, increase stability if there's, if there's um, weakness um, there. Try and, um, if, and also, if you can manually correct the position of a foot, they might have a good chance with, with orthoses redistribute pressure under the foot as well, because they often get a lot of pressure on the outside border. Metatarsal um, bars can be really good if there's a lot of toe clawing, and, and we're going to try and increase stability. And because um, they often have this pes cavus foot um, posture, not everybody, some people, some of the um, adults have plainness as well, but you can introduce wedging. Um, and there's a, there's a, um, a study that was done um, by one of our colleagues in, in Australia who found there was improvements in foot pain and function. And then most of the, most of the time is foot and ankle issues with, with CMT. 
and we don't t tend to see the proximal weakness unless it's, it's a much more severe um, presentation. So um, lots and lots of different types of AFOs, but really it depends on how they present foot drop. I mean, we know there's lots of ways you can address foot drop, um, but also we've got to think about stance phase control with people who have plantar flexor weakness as well, which some do. Um, and so we try a variety of things. So I, I think we'll probably cover some of those in the, in the cases. So for time, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Kida. I'm now delighted to invite Anna May, Dr. Anna Mayhew to join us. Uh, Dr. Anna Mayhew, the jet setter, spends a lot of her time doing in, involved in international trials and is going to speak to us about the impact of novel drug treatments and up and coming clinical trials. Seems appropriate. Morning. Is that all right? Yeah. Good. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to uh, rattle on, try and keep us uh, up to time. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, novel drug treatments and a little bit more about um, evolving uh, trials uh, related to physiotherapy. So this is just to give you, so the objectives here are to give you a broad understanding of what's happening in neuromuscular disease. Um, and to be aware of what we're planning to do in the physiotherapy world, but also then a little bit of information about resources that will be uh, maybe useful uh, for, for you uh, to, to access later on as well, because there certainly isn't time uh, within a course like this to cover everything. So I, I wanted to talk particularly about um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy, and I think it's important to remember that um, our current management of DMD is all around the use of steroids. That's been ongoing for some time, and they have had um, the most positive impact uh, on function uh, compared to anything else that, that, that's been delivered in, in recent years. Um, there, are, uh, there have been trials going on, such as the 4-DMD trial, to make it more clear what is the best dose or dosing regime for those steroids, uh, because there's a wide variety over the uh, uh, across the world about what kind of uh, dosage is best, and the 4-DMD results should be coming out uh, fairly soon. The other licensed treatment for Duchenne muscular dystrophy is uh, translana or atalurin. Um, and at the moment in the UK, if you are ambulant boy with Duchenne and you're two years, uh, two years old and ambulant or older, then you are eligible for, for such a, a treatment. Um, it is not a, uh, a cure um, and it is only eligible for about 13% of patients um, uh, regarding the effect that it has. So not every boy with Duchenne would be eligible for it. Um, there is a, uh, a long-term follow-up of those patients in terms of like a managed access agreement so we can learn more about the long-term impact of atalurin uh, in Duchenne boys. But once they lose ambulation, they are no longer eligible. Um, there are other uh, drugs out there that are, uh, that are semi-licensed for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, such as uh, uh, etabilersin, which is in the US only. There's another drug known as idebanon. It's not an approved treatment. However, some patients can access it through um, an early access to medicines uh, scheme. Um, however, uh, it is very patchy and postcode lottery uh, regarding whether you can actually get it or not. Um, there are still drug trials uh, uh, related to its use going on, even though that some uh, patients can access it actually within the NHS. So that's a kind of an overview of what's happening uh, in Duchenne, but really to to uh, talk a little bit more about what's going on in terms of therapy, I think it's very important to understand the complexity of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And that's probably why there is no magic cure. And it's because it's a very complex disease right from the word go of the genetic uh, defect itself, where different therapies are going to target that. So that will be your gene therapy, exon skipping therapies, stop codon suppressors, and that is about restoring or replacing the dystrophin. But in terms, I'm not very good with this pointer. 
Uh, but in terms of what else is going on, um, there is uh, a defect within this dystrophin glycoprotein complex, which is about uh, how the dystrophin fixes to the cell membrane. And there are several uh, therapies that aim to do something about that defect. There is a loss of membrane integrity, and there are therapies that try and regulate the calcium balance. There is the inflammation associated with this genetic defect, and, uh, and some of the therapies aim to reduce the inflammation. There are therapies that aim to restore the cell's energy. There are therapies that aim to improve muscle growth and protein. And with the resulting fibrosis and necrosis that you get in Duchenne, there are therapies that try and combat the fibrosis, which is why no single therapy is going to be that magic bullet. And it may be that for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we're looking at a combined um, multi-drug uh, focus uh, for it as in terms of management. So I just wanted to talk about some of these uh, drugs because uh, if I gave this presentation 10 years ago, uh, it would have taken me about a minute and a half. Um, but the world has changed uh, so much in terms of therapies uh, that, you know, it's going to take a little bit longer today. So I'm not going to talk about everything. So as I said, some of these treatments are already uh, uh, actually uh, into uh, management. Uh, Atalurin is, is being accessed through the Managed Access Program. There's some other... Um, uh, studies that were going on until very recently, such as WAVE, um, which was uh, terminated due to uh, lack of efficacy shown within their uh, primary outcome measure. And there's a, a trial that four, four weeks ago we were still recruiting for and training for, and it's gone. Uh, and that is a little bit of what's happening in Duchenne at the moment. It's quite a difficult field to work in because when uh, several of the trials are not reaching their primary outcome. So those are trials that are looking at restoring or replacing dystrophin. There are, uh, there's a lot of work going on around gene therapy, and the main partners in that are Sarepta and Pfizer at the moment, which are companies that have trials going on. Uh, Solid is one that was going on but is on hold at the moment. It's back, okay? In the last week. In the last week, okay. Right, so, yeah, it's a little bit... Uh, Things, it's been on hold, it was back, it was on hold again, it was back again, okay. All right, agenathon is another uh, planned therapy. So the problem with gene therapy in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, this is the main point, you don't need to remember all the drug companies. Uh, uh, the main point is, is that the protein involved is a very large protein. And the way that gene therapies got into the boy is by hiding it in a little virus called an AAV virus, AAV uh, virus 8 or 9, and they tuck... The, the genetic material that they want to get into the boy uh, in a virus. But because the dystrophin protein uh, correction is so big, they can only put the portion of it within that virus. And so when we talk about trials, um, gene therapy, uh, in these conditions, they talk about um, like a mini or micro dystrophin that they're trying to get in. And so that is not going to have the same impact. The other um, issue with uh, 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 gene therapies is um, that, what was I going to say? Oh, yes, that these boys grow. So you put the gene therapy in, and it's a certain amount of material in a certain body size, but of course, then the boys will continue to grow and they, they become less impactful. So, again, a lot of excitement around gene therapy, but the very important message is it is not a cure. Uh, reducing inflammation, there's some key trials that, you, uh, that, that are going on that, that are of interest. I'm not going to talk about everything. Uh, Vomolarone is a steroid alternative which hopes to have less of the side effects. Uh, that could be very useful for us. There's uh, a very nice study looking at tamoxifen, uh, which, of course, was originally used within uh, breast cancer, uh, which uh, is a, uh, a, an academic trial that's looking to see if that can be useful. Um, and uh, several others going on. Um, and what's quite nice in the UK is that Catabasis, another company, now have some funding for a non-ambulant study uh, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is, which is great, because all of the drug companies go to that sweet spot of four- to seven-year-old ambulant boys, but as soon as you become too severe or you've gone off your feet, the drug companies aren't interested because they've lost their opportunities to really, they think, show change. So it's exciting that Catabasis are coming up with a non-ambulant study. Uh, regulating calcium uh, imbalance, 
There is uh, ongoing work around that, but they're in quite early phases, so phase one and phase two, which is still just, just beginning to go into patient group, really. Uh, it's very early on. Um, improving muscle growth and protection. Uh, the big studies that we're dealing with uh, in the UK are Juvinostat, um, but there are some interesting work done with Capricor, which is another area that, um, that, that, that is uh, look, another company that's looking at this group. And uh, they have done some nice work looking at cardiac uh, outcomes, but also seeing some improvements in upper limb function in a non-ambulant group. So I think Capricor are one to watch. So, if uh, you were uh, working at a centre and you wanted to know what trials were happening in the UK, I'd say one of the best places to go to is the dmdhub.org, uh, and this will allow you to find uh, um, where clinical trials are actually happening, and because of the work of the DMD uh, hub through Duchenne UK, uh, there has been um, an increase in the number of centres in the UK actually uh, recruiting and able to do clinical trials with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So when we started, it was all about um, London and Newcastle. Um, those very quickly uh, uh, reach capacity and to order into capacity builds and to give opportunities for patients all over the country. Uh, other hub sites have been set up um, in Scotland, Liverpool, Leeds. Da, 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 da. Don't be offended if I don't mention the name of particular uh, centres. This is the place to go and find out. And on that website, you will be able to, for instance, search for the Vermolarone trial. It will give you a list of the UK sites that are... Um, that are, that are sites for that particular study. It will tell you whether they're closed to recruitment, open to recruitment, and it'll also give you information about the inclusion, exclusion criteria, etc., which can be a very useful uh, resource both for parents and for clinicians. It also gives information about trials that have terminated, so it can help people keep up to date because it is a rapidly changing uh, world. The fact is that most of these uh, trials are still aimed at ambulant patients already on a stable dose of steroids, but I think we're beginning to see some change there, partly because, bec because the field is becoming very crowded uh, and they need to look at the impact of some of these potential therapies in uh, different populations. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to say that um, there are other things going on for Duchenne muscular dystrophy that are not drug therapies. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about exoskeleton study um, and some orthotics work uh, that we're doing here in Newcastle. Ta-da! So she'll hate me for this big picture. Um, but we've just got funding um, to do a pilot study to compare... Um, two methods of managing an ankle contractures, so that's nighttime AFOs and contracture control devices. They are historically devices that we've used here in Newcastle. That's why we're evaluating those particular two. We know that there are very important and very useful other methods of um, uh, managing ankle contractures in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but for us this is a starting point. Um, and uh, that's something that we're, we're uh, looking forward to getting stuck into, and Dion is uh, leading that with me as PI. Uh, there's some nice work on around exoskeletons. So exoskeletons, which provide muscle power and muscle strength, were originally designed for the military. Uh, <sighs> there we go. Um, and they are proving that uh, they could be uh, useful to have these soft exoskeletons that can aid boys who are losing muscle power and strength and function. And there is some nice work going on with solid in London, but that is just one of, um, uh, one of many other companies who are working with, with similar technologies. And it's not just for Duchenne, but I'm just using this as an example of something that's happening in the UK. Right. Um, SMA. So SMA is the other burgeoning area of uh, clinical trials, and there are different therapeutic targets for SMA. So as uh, Dion said earlier, uh, SMA is about having a, a missing SMN1 protein. And there are some therapies, such as gene therapy, that aims to replace that SMN1 uh, uh, protein via a viral vector, and one company that's involved in that is Avexis. Uh, the 
other uh, uh, way to do that is to actually, uh, the other therapeutic technique is to improve the expression of SMN2 protein, um, and that can be done in various ways, and the companies working with that are Biogen and their drug Nursin, whose commercial name is Spinraza. Uh, Roche also have a small molecule, and uh, Novartis have Branaplan, so another uh, set of um, ways of tackling uh, SMA. There, are, there has also been work done around pre preventing motor neuron death, and that's with a company called Roche and a product called uh, Olexorzim, something or other. I felt that I should actually have practiced how I uh, pronounce these names. I think drug names are specifically devised to, to be unable to pronounce. I've decided that, and um, yeah. I think we all have codes for what happens. Um, and then there is other work uh, looking at around increasing mus muscle strength and endurance, and that's with companies such as Cytokinetics uh, and ScholarRock. So there is a lot of work going on. So let's give you an update on what's happening there. So uh, I'm not going to go through that. Now, there's a very nice uh, video um, which you can access uh, on YouTube if you just put in, I think it's just SMA and... Uh, Spin Raza will take you to this, and it's a very nice animated video. I don't know if it will. No, I'm not going to play it off there. Uh, it's a very nice video for you to look at. Just explains the mechanism of action of, of uh, therapeutic targets for SMN2 protein. So let's just take Spin Raza. Uh, it's or Nursi Nursin. Okay, it's original uh, trial name. And the point is, is that the drug comes in via an intrathecal uh, injection, which has a particular burden to, to the family and means that you have to have an accessible spine to get the injection in. What happens is you get loading doses in the first couple of months, and then those doses become more spread out. But they do need to continue. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the story, because SM, uh, so Spinraza is available to patients through something called the Managed Access Program. But it's rather a complicated story, and I want to tell it to you briefly, because I think it illustrates um, one of the things that is often forgotten when we uh, think about the excitement behind clinical trials. So you have hundreds of clinical trials happen and take place, and a very, very small number, one in a hundred, actually ends up as being uh, a, a drug that worked, you know, a successful trial where they met at least their primary. So there is huge attrition uh, from clinical trials. And I think that's something that as a group uh, of neuromuscular specialists has hit us quite hard. I think when we started our first clinical trial, we're thinking, yes, here we go, treatment. No, here one trial, it failed. Uh, it was very upsetting. But now we're getting into this swing of more and more uh, uh, you know, trials that don't work. So when Spinraza came along and they stopped the trial early because the results were so good, we were like, wow, you know, this was big news uh, for us. And um, because those trial results in the autumn of 2016 were so positive the trial was ended, Biogen expanded their, or well, opened up their global expanded access program for type 1, so for the most severe type. And very shortly after that, surprisingly, the American uh, drug approval body, the FDA, approved Nursing Nursing for both children and adults with type 1, type 2, type 3 SMA. Wowzers, okay? What was happening in the UK? So um, in January 2017, this extended access program had been opened up in many countries, but there were enormous funding and admin issues, and nothing happened. So families started traveling across the pond uh, to get treatment on the continent. Um, and actually, by November 2018, Biogen closed that program to new infants uh, in the UK. So on top of that story of the global access, now let's look at what happened in terms of approval. So um, following the successful trial, what happened next is that um, there was the NICE had to uh, do an appraisal of the therapy and the results of the trial, and they started that process back in January 2017. So they started saying, okay, we'll look at the evidence and we decide if this is something that we can offer in the UK. Um, in August 2018, 18 months later, NICE released its consultation paper 
and recommended that, that Spinraza was not going to be made available on the NHS because there was insufficient evidence and high costs. And the community of SMA who saw their, their you know, friends and colleagues on the continent getting treated and everybody in the US, USA getting access to treatment were rightly devastated. And there was a lot of campaigns, letters to NICE, discussions within Parliament, a lot of effort was put in. And finally, in May 2019, 17 months after that start of the process, Nursi Nosen was made available to immediately by Biogen to type 1. And on the 26th of June of last year, it was made available via the NHS with type 1 and type 2 and type, would begin to get access. So we began to get some access. However, it was not universal access, and the uh, delivery of that would be only made available um, uh, through the managed access agreement, and there would be quite strict criteria on who got what. So July 2019, they finally announced some new managed access because there was a lot of discussions around the inclusion-exclusion criteria. And uh, what happened was that this was just from July last year, Type 1, 2, 3, and pre-symptomatic pre children who met the revised entry criteria could get access to the drug. Um, but the key change was, is that um, now, if you were ambulant as an SMA patient, so if you were still walking but had lost ambulation within the last 12 months, you could access Spinraza. However... If you didn't, within 12 months, regain the ability to walk, they'd take the, take the drug away. Okay. Now, for those of us who know SMA, uh, that was hideous, because we're not only looking for improvements in uh, walking ability, we're hoping that it's going to, and know it influences, uh, arm function, trunk, and other uh, ADL. Um, there are two things that existed with the arrival of this managed access program. There is a multidisciplinary clinical panel where um, individual centres can take individual case studies uh, where they want clarity on whether they should get treatment or not or what's happening. They can take that to that um, uh, clinical panel for individual advice. And there is also a managed access oversight committee, which includes clinicians and one physiotherapist, uh, to uh, help drive um, and review this managed access agreement, if you like. Um, Scotland is slightly different, so NICE is, uh, England, Scotland is, is slightly different, and um, in February 2019, it was made available to all type 1, type 2, and type 3. However, there has been a lot of capacity and practical issues, and there may be somebody in the audience who can uh, shed light on that as well, but that has been a problem. So the current status of, of managed access in the UK is that for children, there are about um, 17 centres tr treating children, which has been fantastic. Uh, so progress has been made, play, uh, as, you know, has been made, and, and we have a cohort of patients who are actually on the, on the drug. And as I said, there's the an oversight committee and the complex cases can go to the review committee. For adults, uh, we're uh, further behind. Um, uh, the Biogen has just, well, we've just agreed that there are going to be eight sites in the UK that will treat um, uh, adults with Spinraza, um, but we need NHS Eng uh, England approval, um, and there is going to be a specific network of physiotherapists and a launch of that meeting in a couple of, no, next week, week after, something like that, 28th of um, January. We're going to launch an adult network because... Part of the managed access agreement is that if you're on this therapy, you have to get a certain uh, physiotherapy assessment of your function. And uh, historically, most of adults with SMA don't get that assessment, and the physiotherapists are not trained to do that assessment. So there, is, we, there will be work for us to do. Uh, how am I doing for time? Am I doing OK? No. OK. Um, so I just wanted to, I'm not going to show you that video. Oh, and yes, I am. So just for those of you who are not familiar with type 1 SMA, it is a, a profound weakness in these children. Okay, so we, they're never sitting, but their arm function is very poor, and this is a demonstration of that kind of 
very frog-like posture that you would see in a new type 1 SMA. And there is another treatment, and which is the gene therapy treatment, which uh, uh, Avexis have been um, uh, dealing with, which is the gene therapy, which is now approved by the FDA and is under consideration by EMA and NICE. And actually, there's been a statement that that is, uh, there are going to be some compassionate, 100 doses compassionate use. That's right, isn't it? That sounds about right to me. So that is going to be made available in the UK. But this uh, was a, uh, an infant who was treated uh, very, very early on with SMA. We don't know if there would have been a type 1 or type 2, but that muscle strength there is, is something un unparalleled. Okay, so the early results from Avexis, uh, certainly from the US studies, were amazing, and we all uh, blew our mind, and that is uh, a trial that is now ongoing in Europe, um, and Newcastle and London have been recruiting sites uh, for the Avexis study in gene therapy, and we're waiting to find out more about those results. However, and I think this is really important, because... Uh, there's been a lot of buzz around SMA, and, and it's, kind of, it's kind of taken, it's stepped over Duchenne in terms of successful therapies that are now coming to market. But I need to remind you that not everyone responds to Spinraza. We have, uh, we have had children who have had very little uh, change on Spinraza. And, and, it is, and it is also true that not everybody is going to respond to gene therapy. It is not a cure, it is not a magic uh, uh, bullet. And what I get fed up of being told is that somehow, oh, if, my, if, uh, if, if a child is on Spinraza, uh, then they should have, you know, lots of physiotherapy. Well, yes, but that's, it's not about being on Spinraza. Every child and adult with SMA should receive standards of care and physiotherapy, if that be one of them, okay? And that is something that is, that is uh, sometimes overlooked. You know, if you're not on Spinraza, you still need therapy, you still need input. It's not just about being on a treatment trial. But there are implications for us as therapists uh, because we have uh, treatments available now um, and up-and-coming treatments, and it's because there is this evolving new phenotype uh, and that is something that we are going to talk a little bit about later in, uh, in the day when we, we look at orthotics. But we are going to need, need to reconsider our management and our assessment. And we need to work together as a team for that. Um, because it's not just about what happens in Newcastle or London, it's about what happens across the country. And we need to compare notes and success stories and failures. And that is something that, uh, that we are very keen to promote here today. Uh, that, that we have to have that, you know, that cross-party working uh, between the north and the south and the east and the west uh, for us to all move forward successfully. Yeah, I think I've said that bit. Um, there are other therapeutic uh, targets for other conditions, but the, the field is much slower. Uh, so most of the studies going on in limb girdle, etc., are natural history studies, but gene therapy is up and coming. It is in the shadows. There are companies uh, knocking on the door. And I think the most important thing that we've learned from Duchenne and SMA is that we need to get our house in order in terms of having the right outcome measures to assess these uh, individuals with. Resources. Um, this is whistle stop. We'll make sure that a copy of this is made available. Um, there's a lot of uh, information on the muscular dystrophy website. The parent project uh, website is very, very helpful for updating yourself about clinical uh, trials and current therapies. Um, Treat NMD, you can access all of the standard of care documents. Um, there are the APCP, so the Pediatric Guidelines to Physiotherapy Assessment and Management of Neuromuscular Conditions, and that is a very, very useful resource that is uh, available to you. Uh, there, are, there are some courses being run about recognizing neuromuscular disorders, uh, which are very helpful. They're up-and-coming courses. They're about assessing normal development and therefore abnormal development and how to make referrals forward. And uh, there are two more events running this year, one in Belfast on the 3rd of March and one in London. And there's been a lot of uptake. They're aimed at... Um, uh, midwives and health visitors, but we're finding that we're seeing a lot of physios and OTs coming to that to learn about normal and abnormal development. 
Um, there is OpenTAT, which is a website, which is a resource for AHPs who want to know more about assessment and management of neuromuscular conditions. It has pages particularly on Duchenne, SMA, um, and up-and-coming modules on limb girdle disease and glycogen storage disorders. Um, within that, there are virtual clinics where you can uh, learn how to score uh, and assess and do it properly, your North Star ambulatory assessment. But there is another one coming up for the uh, North Star assessment for limb girdle type dystrophinopathies, or the NSAD. There'll be a virtual clinic for that. So uh, that's very exciting news. So uh, thank you. I've finished. Thank you so much, Ella. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, you, you, you may gather I'm using a bit of chairman's license and uh, ho hopefully you actually do take the opportunity at coffee break to get your questions into the speakers um, because we, we, we could be running tight for time later on. If I could ask um, our panel for the first case study on Duchenne muscular dystrophy to come up. Um, uh, Gita, I think you need to have a word with Dion, who was supposed to leave you some time. <laughs> I didn't get the chance to introduce uh, Dr. Gita Ramdari, uh, who, who is a consultant AHP down at Queen Square. Th thank you for that, Gita. So the idea in this session is the case study is going to be presented by our, our friendly surgeon, Mr. De Gell there, uh, our orthodist Rosa, <laughs> and Meredith is doing the introduction, I believe, on the physiotherapy aspect. Well, that okay, guys? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I did see one of the questions earlier was about cathodes in DMD, and that's going to be what the, uh, a, a large part of this case study is about. Um, I'm Meredith Jones, I'm one of the physiotherapists here in Newcastle. Rosa and I do um, the weekly joint orthotics clinic with, um, that we're, where we just see patients with neuromuscular disorders. And the case study we've got today with Mr. De Gelder is, is one of our young men um, uh, who's been through surgery this year. So uh, just to revisit Duchenne briefly, um, for those of you who have seen one or two Duchennes, you will recognize they have a very classic pattern um, in their presentation and in their gait. Uh, we see toe walking, we see a, um, a hyperextended knee at initial contact and maintained through stance often for stability. We'll see a lordosis because of the pelvic weakness as the disease progresses and walking becomes more laboured. We see not only the lordosis but we'll start seeing an anterior pelvic tilt. The Duchenne boys are remarkable in their ability to make fine adjustments to their posture to keep the ground reaction force in front of their knees for stability and behind the hip to keep them upright. As these boys age and walking becomes more laboured and more difficult, they are petrified of falling. And it is with good reason. When these boys fall, because of the steroid regi regi regimes that we put them on, which is gold standard treatment for Duchenne, it has an osteoporotic effect and so falls can be quite catastrophic in these boys. Fortunately... <laughs>